All right. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Edita Kova. Welcome to Filteractive Festival, again, totally um, online. Our special guest today is really, really big name in the film industry, Oli Rankin. Hello, Oli. Hi, Edita. Pleasure to be here. Hi, it's it's. Yeah, it's great to uh, to have you. Oli, uh, for those who don't know, is a um, creative technology pioneer who will share today with you uh, his philosophy and um, approach to always being at the cutting edge of uh, immersive storytelling. We'll talk about um, artificial intelligence, we'll talk about virtual reality and many, many more because um, Oli is, you know, exploring new technology since more than 20 years. Am I correct? That's right. Yes. Makes me feel old sometimes, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be a long story uh, because it's really, really big experience. Yeah. In, in um, exploring new technology, but not only te techniques and media to, to find new ways to engage, inform and entertain you uh, guys and girls, you people. So it's, uh, it's, it's really a huge thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I think I, you know, I got fascinated with um, science fiction and with movies when I was young, and I never really imagined that I could have a, a career in film, but um, sort of stumbled into it and and have just kept on exploring. Okay. I may think after, you know, doing all that research and talking with you during our last uh, short call, short, uh, small talk we had online, that I know almost everything about you. But of course, I, I know that I'm wrong, so wrong. Uh, I know nothing. Uh, and uh, I know that we have uh, less than 30 minutes or maybe a little bit more uh, to wrap up somehow this fantastic experience. And it's going to be difficult. I, I, I know it because there is so many things I want to discuss uh, with you. So maybe we should start with um, with uh, with the question about the biggest milestones in your uh, in your career, you know, from Hollywood to digital AI uh, works, because I found them really attractive and I really like the variety of uh, those projects. They are totally different uh, from each other. Yeah. So, you know, I guess um, I started out studying artificial intelligence at, at university before it was cool. Um, and without really any clear idea of how I would use that in my career, <laughs> um, it just it just seemed like a really fascinating thing, and, and and it sort of it gelled with the with the science fiction interest that I already had, um, and that turned completely to my surprise to be the the golden ticket to to get me uh, my first job in the film industry, working on the Lord of the Rings. Um, which um, started filming just as I was graduating from university. So yes, I was um, very fortunate that um, on that project, they were pioneering a new way of using artificial intelligence to, um, to do the, the big crowd and battle scenes. Um, and obviously that was um, considered quite successful by a lot of people. And so that led into uh, a decade of me working on those kinds of films from the, the Matrix sequels to films like Troy and Kingdom of Heaven and the, the Chronicles of Narnia, etc. Um, but I was, as, as you've already sort of pointed out, I'm somebody who has, you know, wide ranging interests and doesn't want to be stuck doing the same thing all the time. So I actually spent 10 years trying to escape from the, um, from the sort of pigeonhole of being the, the crowd and battle simulation guy and worked my way up through the film industry into the, or the visual effects industry into the position of visual effects supervisor, um, where I got to be involved in uh, a wider variety of, of types of, of visual effects work. And I got to work directly with the filmmakers, with the directors and the, the editors and the, the production side visual effects teams, which gave me that feeling, you know, 
more of being more involved in the storytelling and closer to the storytelling. Um, but all the while I was um, sort of ready for, for virtual reality to come along. And I was also exploring other areas of, of technology. So um, I, I quit visual effects forever, probably 10 or 12 times in my career of 20 years um, to go and work on other things. So I would, you know, take time off to to pursue my photography or music making or storytelling, writing, um, um, game design, and each of these things, each of these breaks that I took allowed me to, you know, to sort of further develop my my creative voice um, and also explore these other technologies and, and figure out how to bring them all together. Because I think the, you know, the future of entertainment is not going to be on a rectangular screen. It's going to be more immersive and more, more fully, um, encompassing of our, of our senses. Um, so yes, I guess, um, some of the biggest milestones then happened actually just in the last few years um, where the um, interactive virtual reality film that I wrote and directed downloaded. I wrote, directed, and I ended up also being one of the um, Unity developers on it. Um, and um, that, that premiered at the Venice Biennale in 2019. Um, and that then went around the, the festival circuit. Um, I also, um, in 2020, um, during the pandemic, uh, one of the sideline projects that I've been working on for a while of doing virtual reality music events suddenly became a lot more relevant, something that we had seen as yeah. being the, the future of virtual events or virtual and hybrid real life virtual events. Um, suddenly became important to everybody during the pandemic. And so that led to um, the Lost Horizon Music Festival in partnership with the team from Shangri-La Glastonbury. Also, in 2020, I um, became a member of the Unreal Virtual Production Fellowship and made a short film entirely in Unreal using virtual production filmmaking techniques. And that film has also been on the festival circuit this year. Um, and then, yes, this year I've continued to sort of build upon all of those things.
uh, yeah, sh short summary of 20 years of uh, experience and touching almost everything. Uh, I like the idea of mixing, you know, the different ways of telling the uh, the story. But um, yeah, and all those projects you you mentioned um, uh, before are really amazing. But before we dig into a few of them, because they are different, like I said uh, at the very beginning, I'm curious. Um, uh, you have done in virtual reality everything. Let, let, let's admit it. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, where we where we are right now with virtual reality? Do you think it's a golden age uh, of uh, you know virtual storytelling, or the best is yet to come? I know that the second answer is safer, but. <laughs> Yes, the, the, the best is definitely yes. I'm curious what you say. Um, you know, I, as you mentioned, I, <laughs> um, you know, I'm exploring all of these different areas and I'm constantly thinking of ways to incorporate lessons from other art forms or other forms of storytelling. Um, one, one fine example of that, of course, is that the very first form of storytelling is um you know is the the oral tradition this um story is told around the fire in in prehistoric mm -hmm. times and yeah. we can still learn a lot about how to make virtual reality storytelling better by looking back at, at what made that kind of storytelling engaging and when i'm telling a story to somebody in person or to a group of people i'm constantly looking at the expressions and the reactions of the people that I'm talking to and using that to guide how I tell the story. So there's a, that's an example of how I think virtual reality storytelling is going to be able to use all sorts of metrics and analytics to, to gauge whether audience members are following the story and will be able to customize the story to make sure that everybody who experiences it comes out with the, um, with the full experience. Um, similarly, you know, I think yeah, it, mm -hmm. I think things like 360 video and the big clunky VR headsets that we have at the moment, you know, I don't think either of those things is the sort of the end technology, but I think they're a great stepping stone. We can learn a lot about guiding the eye and guiding the attention of, uh, of an audience from um, by practicing on 360 video. But we can also learn a lot by looking back at the, the traditions of the theater. Um, and similarly, the, these big clunky VR headsets are, are definitely not going to be the final platform. You know, I, 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 could, I equate them to a laser disc. Um, when the laser disc came out, it was a great idea to digitize uh, a movie and to put it on a, a long lasting piece of media in a digital form. But the laser disc was obviously big and clunky and impractical, but everything that we've had since from, you know, um, the, the DVD, Blu-ray, thumb drives, the cloud, these have all built upon that or original idea of digitizing a movie and making it, you know, um, putting it onto a, a, onto a media. So yeah, I think we're a long way away from knowing whether it's going to be contact lenses or brain implants or what, what the actual interface will be for the, for the sort of pure future of VR. And I think it's also wrong to think that there will ever be an end point because, you know, um, film's been around for over a hundred years yeah. and we keep getting better at making film and we keep on sort of upgrading the sound and the video quality. Um, and I think we'll keep on doing that with, with VR as well. Yeah, it's it's like open story. Yeah? We are adding new, uh, new one um, every day and we are learning it uh, uh, day by day. But I, I wonder, is virtual reality or artificial um, intelligence a high entry barrier for filmmakers, uh, for screenwriters, for example, because other industries 
uh, I think, were, you know, before filmmakers using uh, this technology, architects, uh, game developers, um, and, and, uh, and other um, industries. And I'm wondering how it is in film industry. Was it easy uh, to take from this technology and use it? Or uh, is, it, is it like, you know, um, how it works? You just call for, you know, to, to, to only ranking when you want to do something or is it happening differently? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And it's, it unlocks a lot of other questions as well, because, because virtual reality is, is still so new and because we haven't really figured out what the, the ideal use cases of it are, you know, um, we, we've had Mm -hmm. We've had um, cell phones for, I guess, 25 years or something, um, but it wasn't until um, we started putting cameras and web browsers into phones until they started becoming, we, we started having this golden age of, of smartphones. Um, I, I don't think that we've got to that point yet with, with virtual reality in terms of figuring out how to make it ubiquitous or, or why an average person should include it in their sort of in their lifestyle. Um, so at the moment, I still feel like we've got mm -hmm. a few year, a few more years of fundamental experimentation that need to be done. Um, and we need, we still need to have that kind of killer app that justifies why people should put a VR headset on, or, you know, maybe it will be that what happens is some new contact lens technology that we, um, that we don't even know about right now that, that works both to correct people's vision problems and also allows a sort of augmented and virtual reality, um, to be sort of combined with their with their site, um, you know, maybe that will come along, and that will be the the thing that that sort of triggers the mass uptake. Um, but yeah, right now, because virtual reality, how future, close this future is, in your opinion? <laughs> I have been wrong every time I've guessed. So um, <laughs> I think I remember in in 2016 I was interviewed and. And um, somebody asked me what I was most excited about. And I said, I'm excited about the fact that 2016 is going to be the year that virtual reality finally takes off. Um, and I was, you know, that was five years ago and I was very wrong then and it still hasn't really taken off. So um, I'm not going to make another guess of exactly when it will happen. Um, I think it will surprise everybody <laughs> exactly what it is mm -hmm. that causes it to take off. Um, but to get back to your earlier question of how people from the film industry can get into virtual reality or how to, what the barrier of entry is, um, a big barrier of entry is that the, the, the way that you tell stories in virtual reality and the reason that you tell stories in virtual reality is very different to traditional filmmaking. Um, you know, I, I like to, to think of storytelling in a very sort of technical way sometimes. And in that, in that way, storytelling is about strategically revealing information to an audience. Um, so it's about the, the timing of the, the re revelation of information to create the greatest dramatic effect, whether it's to make people scared or, or sad or thoughtful or, um, or, happy um storytelling is all about that and when when you put somebody in virtual reality yeah, building some kind of engagement exactly and when you put somebody in virtual reality then you sort of um remove from the storyteller some of the tools that allow them to control that uh, revelation of information and that that um, becomes the audience that now can decide in what order that they um, find things out so that, that takes a, a big mindset change. And so it's not just that somebody who makes great movies um, on the still on the flat screen can automatically make great virtual reality movies. You need to spend a lot of time thinking about 
why you're telling the story in virtual reality and how to tell the story in virtual reality, how to control the flow of information to, to achieve the dramatic effect that you're going for. Yeah. So I, I like that we are still, you know, um, uh, putting the sense of, you know, doing it into one question, how to, um, how to create real storytelling. It's, it's, you, you could imagine it's so simple, but it's not. We are still looking new ways of uh, doing it. And um, in one of your works, um, Orthogonal, um, you used um, uh, Unreal Engine. You mentioned about it uh, at the very beginning of this conversation. And I had to check what it is, you know, because I didn't know. And, uh, and I checked it. I found out. Uh, that is really, really amazing. And, and it blew me away, you know, and can you um, shortly describe for those people who are watching us, uh, who, uh, who listen and don't know, uh, ask me uh, what it is uh, and, and tell her a little bit, um, how it disrupt the way we are, you know, uh, making films today, because I really believe it's a game changer, but you, you can, uh, not agree, of course, if you have. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely agree that it is a game changer. And I think it, it may actually end up being the killer app that brings virtual reality into, mm -hmm. um, into the mainstream because, um, you know, real time feedback is what almost all artists seek. When, whenever any artist is, is creating something, they want to be able to um, experience what they're creating as they go and to be able to make yeah. adjustments. You know, I, um, my favorite form of artistic expression, by the way, is cooking. I'm, I'm a terrible <laughs> baker because I, I don't like using recipes mm -hmm. um, and I have an instinct for what tastes good together. But when you bake, if you're baking a bread or a cake or cookies, once you've put it in the oven, you, you cannot really influence the outcome. <laughs> there is no feedback. <laughs> right. Whereas, you know, I like cooking things like stir fries or, you know, or, or soups or stews where you can constantly be tasting and adjusting. And this is the same sort of thing where, where, you know, in my visual effects career, I spent 20 years working on things with, um, where every step of the process, um, you didn't get real time feedback. So a director would film something that needed to have visual effects added to it later and couldn't make decisions on set about what the, based on what the visual effects was going yeah. to look like, then the animators would be working on adding those visual effects and wouldn't be able to um, know what the lighting was going to look like until the, the lighting person then took that animation and lit it. So there were all of these multiple disjointed steps in the process where nobody got real time feedback and everybody had to wait to see what the person after them in the process produced. Whereas with unreal and and the broader sort of virtual production industry what you're able to do is you're getting that real-time feedback and you're able to make those adjustments in real yeah. time so you know i like to think of it as mixed reality filmmaking because you get to combine the digital and the real in real time yeah. on the on the film set. Uh, i think that all those tools uh, we are talking about here uh, unreal engine uh, virtual reality uh, augmented uh, reality or artificial intelligence and many more are making you better creator i think more effective uh, that's that's for mm -hmm. sure because you are testing and uh, creating better versions of uh, what you are doing yeah you know some of the things some of the other things that digital creation have brought is like undo in in real life you don't really get to undo yeah. as easily and cleanly as you can but you know photoshop really i think has instilled an entire generation of creators this idea that you should be able to try something and if it doesn't work you just undo it and try something else um 
And so, yeah, I think, you know, that is, that's a big part of it. Um, and then I also look at, I look at game engines and the, the sort of real time engines as being part of a, a continuum of, um, of interactivity in media. So obviously we have, you know, film and television are very currently very passive, but there's no reason to assume that yeah. film and television will always be passive. You know, maybe, maybe the audience in the cinema should be able to, um, to influence the outcome of the story. Um, and maybe everybody on their phones in the cinema could be, you know, interacting with some elements of the story world that, that changes the outcome of the movie. Um, so the more that yeah, exactly. people start to expect to have interactive engagement, um, it's the same thing, you know, there's a, there's a lot of interesting work happening at the moment in, you know, um, virtual humans, whether those virtual humans are puppeteered live by a person in a motion capture suit, or whether they're driven by an AI and can respond um, in real time to, you know, an entire world's worth of audience interacting with them. Um, I think we're going to see more and more interactivity and immersion in entertainment. The, the, the gaming industry being such a huge um, sort of predictor of how much the new generations expect to be able to interact and engage with their content. Okay, so uh, how would, would oh, sorry, I, I forgot my language sometimes, how the future TV would uh, look like in your opinion? Because it's, uh, again, it's mix of everything. Here we have game industry, which is impacting on TV and cinema. Uh, we have virtual reality. How it will look like in your opinion in the, let's say, 10 years future? from today yeah i um i don't think we're ever going to stop reading i don't think we're ever going to stop going to the theater i don't think we're ever going to stop watching two-dimensional um, passive movies and television but i think we're going to keep on adding new formats so video games you know started out with pong which was just about the most basic game that you could possibly imagine. And now when you look at the game industry, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of different gaming formats that require completely different levels and kinds of engagement with the audience. Um, so I think that we will continue to have all of these formats that we have now, but then we'll start adding to it. So there'll be you know, maybe the, the next um, zombie TV series, you'll be able to hold your phone up and shoot the zombies on the screen. And the outcome of the episode will change depending on whether you manage to save the hero by shooting the zombies behind them. You know, this is just, just as an example, um, but it could be a, a fully um, a fully realized uh, narrative series that includes these sort of extra mm -hmm. layers of interactivity. Okay. Did you did you watch um, the, the newest James Bond? Uh, it's not time to die. Not yet. Okay, uh, no. so I won't uh, make a spoiler here for you, but anyway, I heard that we are waiting f for such a long time for this, you know, premiere because of the product placement. Uh, uh, problems uh, because products has changed because pandemic etc and uh, I think that this new technology will will make that product placement easier too because we could you know make it not manually we don't we, we want mm -hmm. to have to you know uh, repeat the scenes and you know uh, create again a film uh, the whole story or part of it, but we can do it thanks to um, the new technology by changing, you know, and personalizing the content that uh, our audience is, um, is seeing and it's, whoa. For sure. And it's, yeah, it's maybe even a, a sort of a scary dark side of cinema that yeah. <laughs> maybe one day the, the product placement will be customized for every single person that watches a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as part of the sort of, you know, cookie driven tracking algorithms that are happening across the internet right now. 
Um, yeah, I'm a little bit scared of how all of this technology that can be mm -hmm. used to tell good stories and can be used to generate empathy yeah. and to encourage people to take positive action in, in shaping a better world can also be used to trick people into buying things that they don't need and um, continuing to consume at levels that are destroying the planet. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> It's a double. Yeah, I know it is really story. important for you uh, to um, and and that you believe that immersive storytelling has great potential to change the world for the better. And maybe it's the right moment to ask in what way to make it more, I don't know, sustainable, more uh, inclusive. What do you think? Yeah, all of those things. Um, I think that I think. And, and this goes back to when I, the very first time that I thought about virtual reality storytelling, when I was in my, in my teenage years, um, and I was reading books about um, virtual reality, sort of science fiction stories about virtual reality. And I, and I then identified that a lot of the problems that, that happen in society are based on people not understanding each other very well. We, we don't know the intentions of another person. We, we react to the outcomes of what happens to us. And we see the world very much through our own eyes and through how things and, and other people's actions affect us. Um, but if we were better at seeing the world through other people's eyes and understanding what their motivations are and understanding that they don't necessarily mean to be harming us, they're actually just doing the best that they can in the circumstances that they're in. Um, I think we could become a much more empathetic and inclusive and fair society. Um, and if we were more empathetic and we were more fair and we did care more about each other, then we would be more able to come together to work to solve the big problems that are threatening human civilization in, in, in total. Mm -hmm. Do you think? So, yes. Um, so, yeah. So virtual reality by allowing you to see the world through somebody else's eyes and potentially be able to hear their stream of consciousness as well um, to sort of, you know, to understand what it is that, that is driving their decision making. Um, it, it's a great way to, um, to improve empathy and to, to hopefully unite people. Yeah. Do you think that that project music festival, uh, lost horizon festival project was some kind of, you know, um, mm, I don't know how to call it, but was the example of, you know, uh, bringing people together, uh, and, uh, watching to each other in different way than usually. I definitely think so. And it's, um, you know, it's still a work in progress. We're still trying to, to do better, but by doing a virtual festival, it made it possible for people who either couldn't afford to travel or were unable to travel or didn't, don't feel comfortable, um, out in public because maybe they, yeah. they don't feel like their physical appearance reflects who their identity is internally. All of these kinds of people are able to, to join in. Um, and I, and I very, very strongly believe that the more diverse and inclusive a group is, um, the, the more it can be, um, the, the more it will seek, um, to find fair and sustainable outcomes for everybody. So I think, yeah, very much so that was very, it's very much one of the goals of Lost Horizon is to, to be radically inclusive, to make sure that every single person can attend and that they can represent themselves in a way that they feel comfortable. They can interact with different people from different walks of life and get, get a different understanding of the world and, and see it through a different perspective. Okay. So how do you merge your virtual reality experience with your activism? Because you do a lot uh, on this field to, to, to make the world better. And I wonder how, how do you merge it? How do you mix this? 
uh, with uh, with uh, with this uh, with this mission you have? Yeah, that's that's a great question too. Um, and part of part of the answer is that um, one thing that makes it easy um, is that virtual reality is such a, a young and challenging industry. So um, mm -hmm. there aren't many people that are making a lot of money or being sort of traditionally commercially successful in virtual reality right now. There there definitely are some companies that are that are succeeding. Mm -hmm. um, but because it is, it's very easy to work in virtual reality and not make a lot of money. Um, there is less temptation for me to, um, to just, you know, to try and use it to, as a mechanism to get rich or to succeed in the traditional, um, capitalist sense. Um, you know, if, um, when I was working in the visual effects industry, and, and if you look back over that career where I quit several times, every time I went back to visual effects, it was because I wasn't making enough money in the other things mm -hmm. that I was doing. And, you know, you need money to survive yeah. in this world. <laughs> right now, I'm very lucky that my partner has a well paying job. And so I have, I'm in this privileged position where I don't need to earn a lot of money mm -hmm. in order to survive. Um, and so I can dedicate my time to doing the things that I care most about. And I'm almost at the point of, um, of giving up on doing virtual reality things to focus 100% on reaching people through the media that is more accessible than virtual reality, because the situation with the planet and the situation mm -hmm. with you know, the climate and biodiversity crises, the situation with the misinformation, political polarization crises is so urgent that by the end of this generation, if we haven't made major fundamental changes, humanity is on a, on a trajectory to quite an ap apocalyptic end. So, yeah. you know, there, there's no benefit in being remembered as a pioneer of new technology if civilization collapses so you know everything that we're doing is 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 meaningless if we can't save the planet and save our species um, okay okay so, so one, I, more, one more sorry again me interrupting because of the delay <laughs> Yeah. So, so what I was, what I was just going to say was that, um, you know, the only virtual reality projects I'm working on at the moment are ones that have a, a social or political or environmental impact aspect to them, because that is, that is the most important thing that, um, that anybody can be working on right now. And I want to convince everybody of my colleagues and friends to also switch to, to focus on that. But, I know that not as many people are in a, a privileged position that I'm in to be able to, um, to do that. Okay. So speaking about young people and uh, speaking about the success that I know that for you is the combination of, uh, many things like effort, like talent, like, uh, like support and help of other people around you, um, uh, like good luck. Uh, and what you can do using your privilege, like you said, uh, to help others, for example, exactly young people who maybe have talent, who, uh, are hard workers, but maybe didn't have as much luck as you. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And I do. Apart I from do this, time, this, 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 um, things the... you, you already said. Right. Um, and I do spend time mentoring young people. Um, but I think we actually do one thing that we do live in a golden age of is, um, free education. Um, I know that not everybody has a, a computer or access to a computer, but, uh, everybody who's listening to this talk that definitely has access to a computer and. We, we live in an era where the tools that we're talking about, Unreal and Unity, are 
and, and Blender, are, these, these are tools that are free to use that anybody who has a computer can download and start to experiment with. And there are so many people um, that are interested in creating these types of content and sharing the, their techniques that there is an almost limitless amount of free educational resources on YouTube. So anybody that wants to get involved in this industry um, that has access to a computer is able to download the software and watch tutorial videos and you know, um, both Unreal and, and Unity have a lot of free assets and resources and training materials. Um, so really, it's the it's the age of doing. Um, instead of instead of being on um, social media or or watching YouTube for just for the fail videos, um, people could be um, using that as an opportunity to to better themselves and to learn how to do what it is that they are interested in doing. You know, when I started in visual effects yeah. i didn't have any formal training in it i just learned on the job and everybody that i worked with was the same um, then for the last 20 years there have been visual effects schools and a lot of them charge a lot of money for people to learn how to you know do visual effects or, or games um, but now you can get almost as good of an education just for free off the internet and if you create something cool um, i think that most companies would um, would consider hiring a, a talented young artist who has taken the time to teach themselves and to create something. Okay, that sounds cool, really. But uh, since we have, you know, only 30 minutes and I see that we have to wrap it up slowly, uh, maybe last question, because you mentioned a few times that you, I, that you, were quitting, you know, um, quitting um, uh, visual effects many times. I, I thought that it was only once uh, when you did it and then traveled to Tokyo, <laughs> then Europe, uh, then uh, eventually you, you came back. And, and, uh, and I was curious what, you know, forced you to, um, to, to do it and what you, do you love in this field the most? But I think that after this this interview i might know it but maybe i'm wrong because i really feel um when we are talking here about your passion and um, and what you do in this industry that uh, you you really like the challenge of doing things that haven't been done uh, before and whether it is you know a virtual reality or uh, is it uh, unreal engine on or Anything else, like, you know, creating new ways to educate young people. I think that you like the most in it uh, being the, the first, you know, but maybe I'm, I, I'm wrong. Tell me. No, that is, that is very true. Changing, um, changing I'm, the status I'm quo. Interested. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely interested in doing things that have never been done before. I, I love it when um when there's a, a new idea or a new challenge um what i've always been frustrated with is the um the visual effects industry certainly uh, got into this sort of what they call the race to the bottom where each company was trying to um do the same work for cheaper or quicker um, and that had this sort of negative impact on the, the quality of the artistry and the, the creative decisions that were getting made in order to, to achieve that. Um, and the thing I like about um, exploring new things is that they're often, um, they often don't have that same sort of profit motive attached to them. You're able to try and do something as good as you possibly can just for the, for the sake of figuring out how to do it. Um, and that is yeah. definitely then everything changed and you have to start uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But as I was saying before, every time you pick up something new, you're, you bring with you the experience from the other media. Um, and you know, a lot of artists will try and retell the same story in a different medium or, you know, um, or tell the same type of story as they as they transition from medium to medium. So 
I think um, I don't think of any of the things that I've done as being wasted because I've learned and I've grown and, and that maybe is even more important yeah. to me than um, than actually anything that I might have accomplished. Yeah, you are, you are who you are because you've done what you've done and you experience what you experience and nobody would, will uh, take it from you. Yeah. Thank exactly. you very much, Oli. It was great pleasure to talk with you. And I bet that many young people with, will get much inspiration from this uh, interview. I hope so. Uh, so thank you again. It was Interactive Festival with Oli Ranking as a special guest. Uh, been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having Thanks. me as a guest.